You're listening to the Psychedelic Invest Podcast, where we speak with founders, CEOs, investors, advisors, experts, and thought leaders in the brave new world of psychedelics and entheogenic medicines. Brought to you by Psychedelic Invest, bringing you unparalleled psychedelic investing data and analysis. Psychedelic Invest is the industry's leading resource for those looking to invest in the burgeoning psychedelic industry. For more information and to access all of the podcast episodes, check out our website at psychedelicinvest.com slash podcast. And now, here's the host of the Psychedelic Invest podcast, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is the Psychedelic Invest podcast. My name is Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And our guest today is Amanda Ryman. She is founder and CEO of Personal Plants. They're really taking an approach of bringing the idea of plant medicine, particularly in the psychedelic space, to the general population, right? Like, how can people really understand this? Where are the applications? How can we educate a community around this? Some really interesting facets around psychedelics and, and some of the work we're doing in the space. And obviously, the, the plant medicine side of this is a big part of that. Amanda has been on our other program on cannabis, longtime cannabis advocate, cannabis expert, We've talked about the world of cannabis, and we're fascinated to talk with someone who is now in the world of psychedelics and these other plant medicines about what's similar, what's different, what have we learned, what have we not learned, <laughs> where are we going to go here, and really just kind of get a sense of you know what the future holds in terms of these rather interesting and quite powerful plant medicines that we have available to us. With that, Amanda, welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much for having me, Bruce. Yeah, always a pleasure. You know, before we kind of dig into what's going on in the psychedelic space and plant medicine there, give us a little bit of the background. I mean, we talked a little bit about your background in cannabis. How did that come about? How did plant medicine, the personal plants concept come about? Tell us a little bit of the story. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I'm a social worker by training and a public health researcher. And I started studying the early medical cannabis dispensaries in the San Francisco Bay Area in the early 2000s as part of my PhD program at UC Berkeley. And what was so fascinating about these dispensaries was that there was a huge community health aspect to them. So it wasn't just about going and buying cannabis and taking it home. It was about communing with other patients. It was about learning how the plant could interact with you, how it could benefit your life. And there was a huge community peer support aspect and a recognition that it was more than just using cannabis that was aiding people in their health. It was the community. It was access to alternative health resources. It was having cannabis gardens where people could actually interact with the plant as it was growing and really get to know their medicine. And that all of these things together created a really synergistic and amazing benefit to community health. So I've always been fascinated in that. And that's really what I've been studying for the past 20 years. I've been looking at the ways that people are using cannabis to avoid the use of other substances to improve their lives holistically and to minimize harms that might come from other things that they might be using. And so I've always been really fascinated by how people, plants, and society interact with each other. And through all of this, I've also been a cannabis patient. I've been growing my own cannabis actually for 25 years, starting off in Chicago in the mid-90s where it was very illegal and there was no internet. Uh And so finding information about how to grow cannabis, consume cannabis was very, very difficult. So all of these things together gave me the idea for personal plants. I really wanted to create almost a virtual experience experience that was similar to what those early dispensaries created. Understanding that even though there are a lot of people that know cannabis and use cannabis, we're really just at the tip of the spear. And when we want to talk about mainstreaming cannabis as an herb that everyone has in their household, that everyone knows how to use, you have to take an approach that's not so niche and really speaks more to the mainstream. So Personal Plants aims to be like the Food Network or HGTV, but for cannabis and mushrooms. And when you think about those channels, Food Network and HGTV, what they did is they took these concepts that people assumed were very complicated, cooking a gourmet meal, remodeling your bathroom, and they broke it down into bite-sized chunks using engaging experts 
to show the average person that this is something that they can do themselves. And so we aim to do the same thing at Personal Plants. We have a marketplace where you can get all of the tools that you need in order to grow and process your own medicinal plants. And we have a ton of content from experts in the field of plant medicine, recipes, how-tos, and ways for the average person to incorporate plant medicine into their lives. And I feel that Personal Plants is really the culmination of everything I've learned as a social scientist and as a medical cannabis patient over the past few decades. Yeah. Now, I'm fascinated because I think that, you know, obviously there's a lot of connection between cannabis and other plant medicines, you know, but there's also, well, I guess it, I feel like sometimes the category is a category because of the, the history of it. You know, the fact that cannabis and a lot of these other, you know, plant and lab based psychedelics are, have all been kind of put together as, you know, schedule one, you know, kind of made illegal around all sorts of political and racial, you know, dynamics. And so we kind of put them together saying, oh, well, these are all kind of similar things. But in fact, I think they're, they're quite different, both from a medicine point of view and from an uh, effect point of view and what people are doing with them. Give me a little sense on how you've kind of categorized this. And, you know, I guess from a plant medicine point of view, you know, not all of the psychedelics are plant medicine. So how have you kind of defined your kind of scope, define what you want to be focusing on? What's your center in terms of the work that you're doing? Well, that's a really good question. And I think that there's a subjective and an objective point of view to that. You know, objectively, these plants have been used for thousands of years. So Mm -hmm. we're definitely not uh, inventing anything new. We are looking at how these plants were traditionally used prior to prohibition and then trying to rediscover these therapeutic properties in a modern setting. And, you know, we can talk about the similarities there with medical cannabis and how that really began the revolution towards legalization was understanding the medical benefits, not that they were anything new, but they were things that had really been silenced in the times of prohibition. And I think we see something very similar with psychedelic plants. You know, subjectively, as you mentioned, plants are not made illegal because they're dangerous. They're made illegal because of racial issues, because of political issues. And so you would expect that their use is going to be somewhat politicized. And so when we talk about the use of cannabis, the use of psychedelic plants, it's really important that we understand the role that culture plays in determining which of these plants are going to come forefront and which of these plants are kind of the tip of the spear. We talk about psilocybin a lot in this way for several reasons, right? It's pretty abundant. It's easy for people to grow mushrooms. They're found growing out in the wild if you know what to look for. Their effects vary depending on dose. They can be extremely mild, almost imperceptible to, Mm -hmm. you know, a mega dose, which is going to be extremely intense. And people have been using mushrooms recreationally in our culture for quite some time. So it's no surprise that when we talk about kind of which psychedelic plants are coming to the forefront as you know, the ones that we're focusing on first, if you put cannabis in that category, even though I wouldn't consider cannabis a psychedelic plant, cannabis was kind of like the first plant that we came across and said, you know, this plant's illegal, but we think there's something here. Let's challenge that question of legality. Let's start to use it. Let's start to do research with it. And then we saw it, you know, kind of infiltrate into society in a way that was destigmatized. And we're starting to see the same thing with mushrooms. When you look Mm -hmm. at places that have decriminalized psychedelic plants, cities such as Denver, Oakland, psilocybin is really the plant that most people are gravitating towards. And we can talk about microdosing, which is something I engage in that's been immensely helpful in my life. But I definitely see psilocybin as the tip of the spear. I think not far behind that are plants like San Pedro. Uh, You know, Mm -hmm. the San Pedro cactus is something that people can grow. It's not illegal to grow. It's just illegal to harvest and process. But it's also a very, very powerful plant that can be given in a wide variety of doses. When we start talking about plants like ayahuasca, then we're talking about the set and setting. You know, where is it appropriate to use these plants? I definitely think within the psychedelic plant queendom, there are plants that read more like cannabis and there are plants that read more like ritual type experiences. And my hope is that we do not commoditize everything. I think that there are definitely some psychedelic plants that lend themselves better to mass production than others. And I hope yeah. that we continue to have that conversation about which is which. Yeah. And how do you treat the the lab-based stuff, LSD, MDMA, some of these other ones who are, they're psychedelics and they're kind of 
you know, categorized, you know, or put in buckets along with plant medicines. I mean, do you, do you see them as, you know, similar? Do you just treat them as a different category? Is it, how do you kind of, what's your taxonomy on some of this stuff? Well, as a, you know, a, a, a researcher and as a scientist, they're absolutely valuable medicines. You know, MDMA was used prolifically through the psychiatry field prior to it becoming illegal. And really yeah. the only reason it became illegal was because it kind of got leaked out to Studio 54 and people realized what a fun drug it was. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you know, oh my gosh, we have to make this schedule one. And there were actually a lot of psychiatrists that testified against making MDMA a schedule one drug because they yeah. knew that it would really take it out of rotation and they saw it as a very useful tool. So drugs like MDMA, LSD, absolutely very powerful therapeutic tools should absolutely be investigated for that purpose and are also very good. I wouldn't say recreational necessarily because I, I don't necessarily like that word, yeah. but I would say kind of therapeutic non-medical use yeah. is also a huge benefit with both of these substances and they're safer than a lot of other substances that people use for the same effect. Oh yeah, I think because they are not plants, they are easier to adulterate. And yeah. so one of the things about making drugs regulated and having them be legal legalized is that you're dealing with the adulterant issue. So when it comes to things like LSD and MDMA, I almost think regulation and legalization becomes more imperative than with something like mushrooms because it is so easy to fool someone into taking something that they don't know what it is. But I don't consider them plant medicines. You know, I would consider a plant medicine something that you can grow yourself and procure yourself or that people procure as plants, you know? So even something like ayahuasca that you're not necessarily growing in your home garden, uh, yeah. where it's procured, it's coming out of the ground. It's a living thing. And I think that is really, I mean, plant medicines are living things that we're ingesting into our bodies. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about kind of the areas you're focused on. So you mentioned psilocybin and mushrooms. You mentioned the San Pedro and the cactus. Like what are the areas that you think are really ripe or, or ready for people developing the sort of the capacity and the ability to grow themselves, use themselves for, you know, self-therapy and things like that? What are the categories you're focused on? Well, what's so interesting is that because of the laws and the way that they've evolved piecemeal across the country, there is a huge variety of knowledge out there and knowledge levels out there among the public when it comes to plant medicine. So really our first step at Personal Plants is to figure out how much people already know. And this kind of comes from my background as a professor. You know, you kind of want to figure out where your students are at in terms of their knowledge mm -hmm. level, and then you want to meet them there. And so Personal Plans takes that same approach. We do an early assessment when someone signs up that helps us understand where they're at in their knowledge of plant medicine. And then we provide them content and information that's going to meet their level. So you may have folks that are very advanced and they're looking for propagation techniques they're looking for cloning and breeding techniques for their plants. They're trying to make compound oils in their kitchens using cannabis yep. oil and oils from other plants. They're trying to make psilocybin capsules and other products. And that is all the way down to the person that's like, what's cannabis? And I, I'm not yeah. saying that like flippantly, and I obviously people have heard of cannabis, but in terms of how do I use it? What do I use it for? What are the different mm -hmm. ways that I can ingest it? There are a lot of folks out there that really don't know a lot about plant medicine because they live in a culture or in a region where plant medicine is not really accepted. And so they're always fed this idea that you go to the pharmacy, you go to the drugstore, you get the pill, you get the Advil, you get the Ambien, like that's what you do. So yeah. for some folks, even asking about plant medicine feels very taboo. And I'll give you a quick example of this. Sure. I was speaking at the Sun Valley Wellness Festival several months ago in Idaho. And if you know Idaho, right, cannabis is very illegal. They just yep. recently legalized hemp and CBD derived from hemp. And I had a booth and folks were coming up and talking to me and they were telling me that they are afraid to Google anything with cannabis in it because they're in a state where cannabis is illegal and they're afraid right. that their employer is going to find out, they're a parent, they're afraid that their child's school is going to find out. So given that there are people still living in that environment 
at personal plants, we have to recognize that there are people all over the spectrum in this topic of plant medicine. And if we assume that people know more than they do, we could turn them off forever. So it's really important that we take the time to help orient people to this idea, just the simple idea of using a plant to treat a headache rather than Advil. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to kind of see how this is going to, I guess, challenge, you know, standard kind of medical, pharmaceutical kind of industry and process, you know, the idea of empowering people to be able to grow their own medicine, dose themselves, use it themselves, I could see as challenging, <laughs> challenging some power systems that are in play. I mean, how, how do you see that? I mean, what do you think is going to happen there? I mean, we've, we've got a fairly significant pharmaceutical industry that has a lot of invested and, you know, has a lot of power in the, you know, the world of medicine these days. I mean, is this going to be a direct competition? Is this going to be, you know, a cozy kind of relationship with them? Do you see this as being a very integrated? How do you think this is going to play out? Well, that's a really good question. You know, I think because we live in America where we really put a lot of emphasis on pharmaceutical drugs, it's hard to remember that the rest of the developing world doesn't necessarily feel that way. And in doing research yeah. for personal plans, I found that 80% of people who live in the developed world rely on plants for their primary source of medicine. So I think that even though we have very powerful pharmaceutical companies, we also have a world that understands the value of plants. I also think that there is a generational thing happening and younger folks are way more uh, suspicious of pharmaceutical companies because of all of the cracks in the infrastructure that are starting to be revealed. I know that this podcast is going to be played later, but it's being recorded in August. And this past week, John Oliver did a whole thing, his third part of the opiate issue on the Sackler yeah. family. And these very powerful families that are making a ton of money off of the deaths of people related to pharmaceutical drugs, I think that is starting to have people question the validity of the system. I think the rise of plant medicines and the fact that people are getting benefits from psychedelic plants in ways that pharmaceuticals could never do for them yeah. is starting to make people question the validity of relying wholly on a pharmaceutical system. That being said, I know that it's very popular to say plants over pills, but I don't entirely believe that. I do believe in modern medicine. I got vaccinated. You know, I do believe mm -hmm. that if you have certain diseases, we have developed drugs that treat those diseases maybe better than any plant we could find because of the way we've been able to manipulate the science. So I really don't have anything against the use of pharmaceutical drugs in theory. I think that they should not be put ahead of plants in every single scenario just for the sake of making certain families richer. That I do not believe in. Yeah. But I do think that there is complementary therapy there. And in my perfect world, people are using plants primarily, but are seeking out specialized care for things that are extremely hard to treat or where they haven't been able to find relief with plants. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious about this this concept of community. You mentioned a couple of times, and you know, and and what you're trying to do, and sort of the the power of plant medicine is bringing together community. Talk to me a little bit about the aspects of community, because I think there's one side, which is you know, how do I get the knowledge to grow my own plants and and use them, you know, to, to various effects or or to treat myself in different ways. But talk to me about the power of community in the actual treatment process, because I think that's a really interesting part of the whole plant medicine world is how community can actually help with the, the sort of the therapeutic process that plant medicines can enable. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's really interesting because our current medical system really encourages people to kind of take their drugs and just be quiet about it. Yeah. Go home and tell me how it goes tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, the whole idea is that, well, the, the, the whole benefit of taking these drugs is that no one will know you're sick right? No one will know you have a problem. And we've gotten so far down that road that it becomes very difficult for people to even share their vulnerabilities around illness, especially mental health, which, you know, we've seen all of the outcomes, the disastrous outcomes, really, with creating a society where it's really difficult to have honest conversations about mental health. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things about plant medicines is that a lot of them are entheogens, meaning that they're not just having mm -hmm. therapeutic benefits in terms of your internal dialogue. They're having therapeutic benefits in terms of how you relate to other people. And for anybody that's gone through trauma, whether that's physical trauma or a mental health trauma, you know that one of the symptoms of that is feeling a disconnect from those around you, feeling like yeah. other people can't understand 
understand what you're going through. And one of the benefits of those early dispensaries were for people that had AIDS. And that was absolutely something that was happening to that population in the 80s and 90s in San Francisco. And it wasn't just social isolation. It was literal physical isolation because of confusion over how the disease was spread. So the early dispensaries, right, the fear that, you know, you could get it from shaking someone's hand or by hugging someone. So the early dispensaries really offered up a place for people to literally let their guard down and be able to share their vulnerabilities, be able to share what was happening to them, um, and be able to actually get physically close to other people. And so plant medicines have a long tradition of helping people connect in spite of illness and in spite of trauma. So for that reason, we're seeing that, you know, these kind of communal healing opportunities, not new, by the way, right, when we look at how these medicines were traditionally used, they are used in the context of community. Even if it's people that aren't involved in the actual ceremony, observing, being there to support the person. Um, So I really see this as a hearkening back to the way these medicines were traditionally used, but also a really refreshing departure from this kind of isolated context that our current medical system insists that we sit in. Yeah. And how do you see this? I mean, I say, I guess I see multiple kind of modes of people using plant medicines, particularly on the psychedelic side is, you know, there's kind of this, you know, in individual use, there's this kind of working with therapist, you know, but they all have kind of some kind of process or some kind of journey that you go through around it. How, how do you see, like, how do you see this developing? Is this going to be, you know, working, working with individuals to help them develop and, and grow their own plant medicine and then use in some kind of therapeutic or quasi therapeutic scenario. I mean, what? How, how do you how do you see this evolving, or what do you hope evolves in terms of building a community around um, plant medicine? Well, I think it's about giving people the tools and the guidance, and then them deciding what's best for them. You mm-hmm. know, I think that's always been the best way to go. So, you know, we want to teach people how to grow their plant medicines. We want to teach people how to process their plant medicines, and we want to give them the guidance on the many ways they can use their plant medicines and give them the resources and the tools to follow their own path and to be able to report back and communicate with each other. But at the end of the day, you know, wellness and healing is a very personal journey. And, you know, the word journey, I know it's used all the time, but the reality (laughs) is is that's what it is, right? So, you know, it's never the same. There's always going to be surprises. There's always going to be things Mm -hmm. you don't expect. And so, you know, how you use plant medicines is really individualized. And one of the things I found from growing my own cannabis for, you know, 25 years is that the cannabis that I grow, and this is going to sound super hippy dippy, especially (laughs) for East Coasters, but the cannabis that I grow, it knows me. Yeah. It knows me. It knows me in a way that the cannabis I buy from the dispensary does not. It knows my energy. It has been there with me since the very beginning. And there is something to that. Again, the plant is a living, breathing thing. It is alive. So, you know, the more we can develop relationships with the plants that will be healing us, the more those plants will know us and what we need. And that's going to be different from person to person. And it's going to be different for the same person throughout their lifetime or throughout the week. And so I think what we're trying to do is help people understand the mindfulness that comes with being in that relationship with your medicine and how that's beneficial to your health. And that's something that we don't get with our current medical system, with our current food system. It's really about consumption. There's not a lot of mindfulness. So I think that there's benefits above and beyond the plants themselves in how we work with them. Yeah, it's interesting because I think in the beginning, I mean, I, you know, obviously some of this is because it's not legally available. You know, people have been growing, so they just have access to it. And then then there's kind of a DIY, you know, do it cheaper kind of angle, which is like rather than, you know, paying kind of corporations to kind of grow and create the stuff, you can do this yourself and it's very cost effective, you know, but then you're bringing up this other one, which I think is really interesting is, is the relationship with the plan and relationship with the process, right? Like gr- growing your own plants to make the medicine to then, you know, go through the journey, you know, extends the process, extends the journey to the actual creation of it. And yeah, I think it, it, it creates a bond between you and, you know, the plant in general or the specific plant to actually make the experience more powerful. It's, it's like it's like growing your own food and eating your own food. Like there's there's something different knowing that you're the one that helped participate in the process to create the sustenance. I think the same thing on the plant side. What what have you noticed in terms of people's interest in your work? Has it been 
has it been on the just, hey, I just need access to this stuff? Has it been like, I want to be able to do it a lot cheaper than I can buy it in dispensaries? Or has it been, you know, around the kind of connection to the plant to increase or to, you know, change the journey that they go on relative to it? Oh, it's across the board. It's across the board. And I definitely would never discount the economic impacts of producing your own medicine. You know, cannabis, as we know, is extremely expensive in dispensaries. There's a lot of taxes, you know, pharmaceutical drugs, especially if you don't have insurance, can be extremely expensive. Over-the-counter drugs are extremely expensive. So yes, there is absolutely an economic benefit to growing your own. You know, people are surprised at how much they can grow just on a few plants, uh, more than they usually need for themselves. And so it's really a great experience for people to just have all the medicine that they could possibly need and not have to worry about it. So I definitely think that that's a reason for people to do it. But yes, there are a lot of folks out there who are tired. You know, they're tired of feeling anxious. They're tired of feeling depressed. They're just tired of being tired. And they feel like the options that they're being given are not appealing. They they don't want to start on another pharmaceutical drug. They don't want to start drinking every night. They're really looking for something different. And yes, absolutely, you can just go to the store and you can buy something. And that's really where a lot of people start. But then after doing that for a little while, they start to get curious. You know, they start to think, what would Mm -hmm. it take for me to make this? You know, what would it take for me to grow this at home? You know, is this something I can do? And, you know, again, I go back to the Food Network. And, you know, there was a time when, and I remember this in my childhood, where the idea of like cooking, uh, you know, a meal from a culture that you've never been to was just out of reach, right? You were like, oh, there's no way I can cook this really extravagant meal, you know, Vietnamese meal. I've never been to Vietnam. And the Food Network said, yes, you can totally do it. And we're going to break it down. We're going to make it really easy. And then what we saw were meal kits, right? We didn't used to have meal kits. There weren't bags Mm -hmm. of fresh veggies that came to your door, right? There were TV dinners and there were microwavable meals. So that evolution, that's where I see plant medicine going. And there's a lot of people who choose meal kits for different reasons. Some people want to make fresh food, but they want some convenience. Some people, it's cheaper than going to the grocery. Some people are really trying to change their health. So I see this as just another kind of cog in that wheel of us realizing that just because something is easy, and processed in no way means that it's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And how I'm curious where uh, on the sort of psychedelic side, how do you see this playing out? And, and particularly, how do you see this as similar or different than what's happening in cannabis? And, you know, we've had now, you know, a decade or so of development of the cannabis industry and state by state legalization. What do you think is going to be similar? What do you think is going to be different as we look at how, you know, particularly like, you know, psilocybin and mushrooms and some of those areas, how is that going to legalize or how do you see that industry developing? Yeah, well, I think, again, we look at medical cannabis and kind of what brought cannabis back into favor, what made people question whether prohibiting it was a good idea. And it was medicine, right? And it was the use of cannabis by people that were very vulnerable in the eyes of the public. So when we talk about people with AIDS, we talk about people with cancer, we talk about people with terminal illness, it was fairly easy for the public to say, yes, those people deserve to have whatever they need in order to make themselves feel better. And so now we're seeing similar conversations around psychedelics and groups like veterans. So, you know, veterans who have severe PTSD, who have depression, who are finding relief from psychedelic medicines, why in the world would we prevent that from happening? Why would we punish this group of people from feeling better because of these antiquated drug laws that nobody really remembers or understands why they were passed in the first place? I mean, those of us who work in it understand, but the general public doesn't really understand. So I think that that trajectory of kind of medical use among a vulnerable population being a way to start to question the validity of the law is something that's very similar between cannabis and psychedelics. There's a rub there, though, because with psychedelics, research is way easier to conduct than it is on cannabis. Even though they both share the same schedule, cannabis, until very recently, was the rule was you could only use the government's cannabis in order to study it. 
And the government was not approving any studies to use cannabis that were not looking for the harms of cannabis. Very recently, the National Institute on Drug Abuse decided that they would start allowing private producers of cannabis to provide cannabis for research. This has always been allowed for psychedelic plants. So when we look at the research on psilocybin, we look at the research on non-plant psychedelics like MDMA, those are being produced by private labs. They're being studied by universities. This is something that was way above and beyond what we could do with cannabis for the last 20 years. So I think that the pharmaceutical development around psychedelic drugs is probably going to happen faster than cannabis because of the access for research purposes. Now, some people turn their noses up at that. Um, There's, you know, a lot of things we could talk about. We talk about the medicalization of plants. Um, That's a whole other show. But I will say that if our goal is to allow as many people to have access to the therapeutic benefits of these plants as possible, we may need to make them into a form that people are more comfortable with, such as a pill or a tablet versus eating an actual mushroom. And we saw the same thing with cannabis. So I think that there's definitely some similarities there. But as you mentioned before, cannabis is one plant cannabis, right? It's There's different levels of cannabinoids and THC and CBD and different preparations, but it's cannabis. Yeah. When we talk about psychedelic medicines, we're talking about a wide variety of plants. Yeah. And so I think that it's not going to be just a blanket, these are all legal now. I think we're definitely going to have to be more mindful about how these plants will interact with the public and where the most appropriate place is for them. So I'll give a quick example there. Uh, We have SB 519 here in California that's been making its way through the legislature to decriminalize psychedelic plants in the state of California. Mm -hmm. One of the drugs, because it's not just plants, they also included LSD and MDMA. And originally they had also included ketamine. That was taken out of the bill because ketamine is already available through a prescription. And they decided that prescription is really where ketamine belongs. It's not something that should just be used by anyone out in the public. It's something that should only be used under the care of a physician. So I could see kind of similar differentiations start to arise when we talk about how we bring these substances out of prohibition. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious where you'd suggest people start. I mean, you know, I I can see the interest. I I can imagine a lot of people kind of being curious about some of this stuff, like where do you encourage people to kind of start this journey or, or start their investigation? Well, you know, of course, I'm going to say personal plans. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, so yeah, so go to our website, which is mypersonalplants.com. And there you're going to find all kinds of tips about psychedelics, about using psychedelics, recipes with mushrooms for make mushroom tea. You can also find grow kits where you can grow mushrooms at home. And we have interviews with folks like Jasmine Hupp, uh, who, you know, has been really amazing and helping people integrate psychedelics into their lives. So yes, I would say start there. If then you're looking for more information, more research related information, I always recommend MAPS, which is maps.org. They've been doing clinical trials on psilocybin, on MDMA, and you can read all about their research there. If you're looking more for news around psychedelics, uh, two great sites are Double Blind and Lucid News. Both provide information about the latest research, the latest policy work that's happening with psychedelics. And then, of course, Dr. Bronner's, the soap, they've been working really hard on psychedelic decriminalization and, you know, really the belief that these plants belong to people. And that's what we believe at Personal Plants as well. You know, these plants are things that everyone should have access to, that everyone should be able to develop a relationship with, and that they shouldn't be held in an ivory tower for only a select few. Yeah, that's excellent. I'll make sure all the links and everything in our show notes and highly encourage anyone who's, you know, curious to learn more, wants to investigate this, go check out Personal Plants. It's uh, uh, some great content, great materials, obviously great access to tools if you want to really start getting into this and doing it yourself. But um, really appreciate all the work that you're doing in this space. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. And uh, thank you for being on the program. Oh, of course. Anytime, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Psychedelic Invest Podcast. If you liked this episode, please be sure to leave a five-star rating and leave us a review. You can find more episodes on all the major podcasting platforms and our website at psychedelicinvest.com slash podcast.